Hey everyone, my name is Philip Tenen. I'm a security engineer here at Data Theorem, and today I'm going to be giving you an informational overview of some uh, research carried out by Google's Project Zero vulnerability division um, against Apple's iMessage platform. Um, so this attack was carried out against iOS 13, iMessage and iOS 13. And with iOS 14, Apple has introduced some new mitigations against this attack. Uh, and so we'll be taking a look both at the original attack carried out by Google Project Zero uh, and Apple's new mitigations introduced in iOS 14. Um, and just so you're all aware, this research was again originally published by Google Project Zero by some security researchers there. Um, and we have links to the original research that this disclosure comes from uh, throughout the presentation. So diving right in, the attack that we're going to be taking a look at here is what's referred to as an iMessage zero, zero click attack. Um, and if you're not familiar with the term zero click, it's a, it's a very powerful class of attack. What it means is that uh, the user is required to do you know, no interaction, i.e. zero clicks for them to be exploited. Um, some sort of less powerful chains might require the user to, for example, um, you know, click on a malicious uh, mail attachment or, you know, browse to an unsafe web page or anything like that. But a zero click attack is sort of the most powerful class because the user doesn't have to do anything. So if an attacker can construct a zero click attack, as Google Project Zero has done in this case, uh, it's possible for them to exploit users with uh, more or less impunity um, because there's very little restrictions on the requirements of the user's environment for the user to be exploited. Okay, so moving on here, uh, as I mentioned, Google Project Zero publicly exploited iMessage in iOS 13 via a zero-click attack. And with iOS 14, I Apple has added some new protections against this attack. And Google Project Zero both wrote public, public disclosure, disclosures pardon me, of the original attack as well as iOS 14's new mitigations. Um, but from a high level, if you did want to carry out some kind of uh, zero-click attack against iMessage or any other you know, remotely accessible uh, system platform, there are a few pieces that you would need to do this. So firstly, you would need some kind of memory corruption vulnerability that you can trigger via a remote action. In this case, it would be uh, a memory corruption that you can trigger via sending a maliciously constructed iMessage payload. Secondly, you'll need a way to break ASLR, which is a scheme that we'll take a closer look at in a minute. Um, thirdly, you'll need a way to turn that memory corruption vulnerability into remote code execution. And then finally, once you can remotely execute code, you'll need to leverage a separate vulnerability to break out of whatever sandbox you're running in. In this case, it would be uh, the process that receives iMessages so that you can then infect the rest of the system and do things like you know, exfiltrate data, or brick the user's device, uh, install spyware, you know, anything you want to do from there. Um, and iOS 14 introduces three mitigations that make all of these goals more difficult to achieve for an attacker. Um, but before we get into the attack itself, there's a bit of background that we need to cover. So the first thing is this piece that I mentioned, this scheme in iOS called ASLR, or Address Space Layout Randomization. Um, ASLR has been around you know, long, long time, um, about 10 years by this point in iOS. And these days, it's sort of a, a standard security feature. And the way that it works is, in the pre-ASLR days, um, the address space is always kind of, it always sort of looks the same. So I have a visualization here of what the virtual address space would look like across three device boots. And you can see all the, all the boxes are always in the same place. The kernel is always down near the bottom. Memory mapped I.O. is always somewhere in the middle. Device drivers are always up on the high end. And what this means is that if you're an attacker trying to exploit the system, it's very straightforward for you to say, you know, okay, I know the kernel is going to be here because it's always here. Um, but with ASLR, or again, address-based layout randomization, things become a lot more difficult for the attacker because what will happen is every time a, the device boots, and in fact, every time a process launches, uh, certain portions of the address space will be automatically randomized by the operating system. So as you can see in this case, you know, um, rather than the kernel always being in the low part of memory across three different boots, it's been shuffled around in the address space to totally random places. Um, so it means that the attacker has to do a lot of extra work 
to figure out where things have been placed. Um, and so the question now becomes, we know that Google Project Zero carried out a zero-click attack against iMessage. We know necessarily this means that they found some vulnerability that allowed them to disclose where things were placed by ASLR. So how did they do this? Well, there's one more piece that we need to take a look at, and it's this, um, this other scheme that's been iOS for a long, long time called the DYLD shared cache. So the idea here, the, the DYLD shared cache is another, um, it's a performance optimization, in fact, in iOS. And the rationale is this. Um, so, you know, pretty much all iOS apps re rely on a conglomerate of frameworks, such as UIKit, Core Animation, Core Image, you know, um, C the CF Network APIs, a, a whole wide host of frameworks. And the thing is that, you know, many apps tend to rely on the same frameworks, these frameworks that are provided by the system. And so you can imagine um, every app doing the same work over and over again of loading and linking these frameworks. And since these frameworks are always the same, they never change as apps are running. Um, it's kind of a bit of a waste to, to load them individually for every app. So with iOS uh, 3.1, you know, 11 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, iOS has introduced to this optimization called the DYLD shared cache, which is essentially this big blob of all the system frameworks all stuck together into one file. And this file is then loaded when the device boots. Um, and so instead of loading and linking every system framework for each app that wants to use them, the DYLD shared cache is loaded only once when the device boots and then it's reused for every app. Um, and once again, this is a significant performance optimization, but unfortunately, it also introduces a security weakness. And that weakness is that the shared cache is loaded once the, when the device boots, and then it stays there all the time after that. So ASLR, as we saw, normally causes memory locations to be randomized each time a process launches, but the shared cache is special and has a constant location after the device boots. Um, and keeping its location constant, you know, certainly is a performance improvement, but it is to the detriment of user security. And we'll see how Google Project Zero took advantage of this. Um, so of course, the question is, Knowing these two things, knowing that we have to defeat ASLR and knowing that there exists a DYLD shared cache that's at a constant location, how can we put these things together uh, to defeat ASLR and carry out our attack chain? Um, and Google Project Zero has developed a really clever technique uh, described in this blog post here uh, called a crash oracle, with the high level idea being that by intentionally crashing the recipient's iMessage process over and over again, the attacker can effectively use uh, an information side channel attack to um, leak where the shared cache has been placed. Um, so once again, the attacker is trying to solve where has address space layout randomization placed the shared cache within the virtual address space. And as a prerequisite to this, we know that the attacker has the ability to construct a malicious iMessage that, that can, you know, when this iMessage is received, the attacker is able to write to any arbitrary memory address that they choose. So one way that the attacker might go about trying to do this is to try accessing every possible address in the address space, uh, with the rationale being that if the address is not mapped, meaning that the shared cache is not there, the process will be automatically killed by the operating system because it tried to access an invalid address, or you know, it would be killed for a page fault, um, a paging violation. Um, and this sounds okay, but unfortunately, the 64-bit virtual address space is really, really large. Uh, and so this would take, you know, unfeasibly long. So the attacker needs some clever technique to narrow down the range where the shared cache has been loaded uh, a lot more quickly. And this is where this technique of the crash oracle comes in. Um, so I've made this visualization here showing sort of what this looks like. And we'll take a quick walk through the steps of how this works. So once again, the attacker is sending a maliciously constructed iMessage, which when received by the victim's device, writes to whatever whatever memory address the attacker has specified. Okay, so starting out, the attacker picks some arbitrary memory address. In this case, it's 06000. The victim's device receives the sign message, um, the vulnerability is used, and the victim's device will then try to, try to write to this memory address. Uh, in this case, we imagine that 06000 actually was a valid part of the shared cache. The attacker got lucky and guessed well. 
Um, and so nothing happens. You know, the, pro the, the process is not killed by the operating system because it did not um, access an invalid address. And because the process was not killed, the victim's device, you know, happily carries on and it sends the attacker a message delivered notification. And so now the attacker can think to themselves, hmm, I received a delivery receipt for this message where I wrote to this uh, 06000 address. Therefore, the process did not crash when I tried to write to this address. And thus they can conclude that this address must be a valid part of the shared cache. Now they can go ahead and refine their search. They can choose another address, in this case, OX3000. The victim's device receives it, tries to write to it, but in this case, it's not a valid address. So the process is killed by the operating system. And since it was killed, the victim's device never has a chance to send a delivery receipt to the attacker. So the attacker sent this message and then, you know, nothing happened. And after a certain amount of time, the attacker can think to themselves, hmm, I tried to write to OX3000 and I never received a delivery receipt. Therefore, the victim's uh, iMessage process must have crashed when it tried to write to this address. And thus they can also conclude that OX3000 uh, must not be in the shared cache because it was an invalid address. And then the attacker can go back and forth like this, picking addresses and narrowing down exactly where the shared cache has been loaded very, very quickly. Um, one way of viewing this technique is that it's essentially a binary search over the uh, virtual address space, um, meaning that the attacker, you know, binary searches are O log N, and so the attacker can very, very quickly narrow down exactly where the shared cache has been loaded, uh, typically within about 20 attempts or 20 messages to the victim. Um, so in other words, the attacker is repeatedly crashing the iMessage process via maliciously crafted messages as a way of revealing the exact location that the DYLD shared cache has been loaded. Um, okay, so that's the attack. As I mentioned, iOS 14 introduces several new protections that make this kind of attack a lot less feasible to carry out. And we'll take a look at those. So firstly, iOS has added uh, special logic specifically to detect this attack. And when it sees that this attack is being carried out, it'll re-randomize the shared cache's location only for the process under attack. So the rest of the system retains the nice performance benefits of having the shared cache and having it in a, in a standard location, while also making it difficult for an attacker to abuse this knowledge to reveal uh, where the shared cache has been loaded. So once again, to, uh, to put it another way, uh, when I try to crash the victim's iMessage process over and over um, to reveal the shared cache location, the system will notice that I'm doing this and re-randomize the shared cache's location only for the iMessage process. A second mitigation is uh, uses the fact that this attack requires, you know, it, it by definition necessitates being able to repeatedly crash and, you know, restart and crash again the victim's iMessage process. Um, and historically, whenever a process would crash, uh, LaunchD, iOS's, you know, uh, process launch daemon, would relaunch the crash process within 10 seconds, meaning that it would only take a few minutes to carry out this attack from start to finish. But with iOS 14, iOS has introduced to this exponential delay before restarting a crash process. So rather than waiting 10 seconds every time before the process comes back up again, first it'll wait 10 seconds, then 20, then a minute, all the way up to 20 minutes in between process launches. So the time to reveal the DYLD shared cache offset has jumped from just a matter of minutes to a matter of hours instead, again, making this attack a lot less feasible. Um, and then lastly, you know, the idea behind this attack is to gain code execution within the victim's iMessage process and then you know, reveal the ASLR slide, leverage that to construct um, ROP gadgets and you know, eventually break out of the sandbox, do other nefarious things. Um, and so this third mitigation is about even if an attacker does manage to gain code execution, how can we still reduce the impact of uh, you know, the scope of what they're able to do? And so the way that iOS has done this is iOS 14 introduces a new service in the pipeline of processing iMessages called Blastor. So when iOS receives an iMessage, there's a whole series of processes involved in this. One of them is called IMAgent. 
Um, and one of these processes, maybe IAM agent, will have the responsibility of reading things from the network um, and then you know, reading an iMessage from the network, handing it off to the next stage in the pipeline. Prior to iOS 14, this one that would read things from the network would also be deserializing iMessages, which is pretty dangerous because if you take advantage of a vulnerability in iMessage deserialization, you're in a process which is also allowed to communicate with the network. So this new process has been introduced, Blastor, which is only allowed to do one thing. It's only allowed to deserialize iMessages, and it has a very tightly controlled sandbox. So it's not, you know, it's not allowed to touch the network. It can't touch the file system. So even if an attacker does manage to gain code execution within Blastor, um, it's, you know, it, it becomes a lot more difficult to um, break out of that sandbox, break out of those restraints, uh, and to further infect the system. Okay, thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. And uh, that's all. Thanks.